you're up. Uh, so we're going to be talking about a new ZB performance tuning tool. Something that Falco has been working on for how long you've been working on this thing for now? Um, I guess it has its origin already a year ago um, from a particular customer that I've been working with, and then it evolved over time into a tool that's that's pretty generic now. Yeah. Epic. So this kind of developed out of uh, profiling, performance profiling, different use cases for specific customers, and then you kind of generalized it after you did a couple of them, two or three, and then, okay, we can get this data together. And so uh, we're going to be making it available for community members to use. You can tap into the wisdom of Falco with this new tool, which is uh, it mostly takes the form of an epic spreadsheet. So how about I bring your screen on here and see how do we do this? All right. You want to walk us through this piece of magical technology? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny as an engineer, I never spent so much time using spreadsheets, but um, it's indeed a quite helpful tool. Let me maybe zoom out one time just to see the full extent of this monster. Um, Epic. And it's kind of split in half. You see there's some coloring here. Well, what is this useful for? Imagine you're playing with ZB and um, you're, I mean, one of the key properties of ZB is that it is horizontally scalable. And that obviously means that lots of people who are interested in, um, you know, high throughput scenarios want to get a good performance out of the engine. And in order to talk about this, um, and you know, sometimes we have this uh, in the forums, people come and uh, they say, well, I have this and that cluster configuration and it's not performing as I like. I have, I feel I have a bottleneck somewhere or something like that. And then for such a discussion, um, usually um, we get like a handful of, of configuration parameters, but to really understand where the bottleneck is, it makes sense to look at all the different configuration parameters that there are to see, um, you know, what which one might be impacting the scenario. And, and there are a lot. And there are a lot, yeah. So the left-hand side of the spreadsheet, the, the bluish colors, um, this is all just configuration data. And uh, the right-hand side of the spreadsheet is um, what is capturing measurements or does different types of calculations to see the performance of different aspects of the engine. So the so, left side is inputs, configuration, mm -hmm. right side is outputs. Exactly. Performance results, got it. So let's go back to a zoom level where we actually see something. And um, yeah, as Josh said, we're we going to post this link um, um, publicly in the show notes. And then basically what you can do is you can take a copy of this and, and um, start entering the data from your test setup and use this as a tool to, for example, communicate with us or also um, just as a tool to capture your own test results and see which ones perform better for you. Um, yeah, and when you're designing a benchmark for for ZB or for, for any kind of tool, really, um, the first thing that everything starts with is um, a load generator of some sort. And in ZB, we would typically have a load generator that starts workflow instances in the engine. So um, yeah, that the first block of configurations here um, is really describing the load. And what we'll do now is I will first go through the, the different columns just to explain what they mean. And then uh, we will go through a concrete example um, using the ZB benchmark from the engineering team to see um, how this would typically look like, what data we would fill in here. So you don't have to create your own one here. You could just use the existing one and then fill in the values that you use. Is that correct? Exactly. So that's the idea. You have this template. You can copy it and just use it as a as a guideline for capturing your data. Oh, and I mean also like the load generator itself. Like there's, there is an existing load generator. That, so you don't have to write your own load generator. Is that right? Um, that is true. Um, the ZB engineering team does have a benchmark test suite that could be reused, and we will probably look a little bit into it today. Um, alternatively, people can also write their own, um, you know, drivers for the tests. Um, so quite common, what I see with customers is things like JMeter or Gatling or um, NeoLoad. So there are different tools out there that are um, pretty 
well established to generate load of various sorts. Okay. And um, there are different ways of how to generate load. So maybe if we did drive into this topic a little bit, um, yeah. obviously the the first thing, not maybe not really the load generator related topic, but the first very key thing that we need to look at is the process model itself. And as we'll see, um, there's actually a separate um, tab here where we will take the process model itself apart. Um, so then the load generator, this is where you would put your load generation tool, like for example, JMeter. Um, then, you know, as part of the load generation, you would probably need um, a ZB client in order to start workflow instances, um, unless somebody generates a direct integration between, you know, JMeter and uh, gRPC protocol, you typically use a ZB client. So just put like the you Java could, client here. You could use, or you could use the ZBCTL command line client, right? That is true, yeah. I have seen some customers using that for benchmarking as well. It might not give you super a lot of control, um, but it's a starting point. If you want to do just a quick benchmark, just use something like JMeter, and then um, JMeter can just run any command line application and can use of course, also ZBCTL to kick off a workflow. Um, it has a bit of an overhead because um, you're you're creating a process for for each workflow that you're starting. So maybe that's not the the nicest thing to do. Mm. Um, yeah, that's why then typically you would have uh, multi-threading in the load generator. Um, it, that depends a little bit on the scenario you're simulating. So it could be that you're just trying to um, have a constant load into ZB uh, and you don't wait for your workflow instances until they are that they are completed, then a single thread might be sufficient. Um, this waiting aspect, by the way, is an extra column, right? So you could start a workflow and then wait for, a, for the response or even wait for the completion of that workflow and then um, only then start the next one. So and especially if you wait for the completion of the entire workflow, and that's maybe a longer running one, um, then yeah, you might need more threads to ingest some decent load. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you don't wait, if there's no waiting at all, then a single thread is usually sufficient to create enough load. So that's so what that's that dash RC is, dash is you don't wait for anything, yeah. you just start them. R exactly. is wait for the response. Oh, look at that. Hence, put help, help, help here. Little paper clip. Yeah. So the dash means no waiting. Uh, R means waiting just for the response, right? The, the start request will come back with a response. And then there's the this feature to wait for the completion of the entire workflow. In that case, you receive your response when the workflow instance has finished. And that okay. would typically be, yeah. Well, it depends on how long your workflow runs. Um, we have customers where a workflow might run a couple of minutes, for example, because there are some waiting conditions in between. And then uh, in such a case, you would need um, many threads in order to really get some throughput. So yeah, this is one important aspect. And you know, it, it makes a big difference if, if I design my test differently um, with this, with respect to this waiting behavior, um, one might get totally different outputs. And this could of course also be a simple bottleneck, right? If I wait for completion and I don't have en enough threads, then maybe I don't get too much performance out of the engine because I'm not starting enough. Um, yeah, classic movement with a spreadsheet, tilt your head a little so you can read it better. Um, so sorry for that, but the, one of the goals here is that we compress the data as much as possible so you, we can really get as much data on a screen as possible. Works definitely good with bigger screens, um, but yeah, we try to compress a lot. So uh, then sometimes people have a certain ramp up time. Um, so you maybe run a couple of minutes uh, of load in, until you start really measuring your performance. Um, that is on the one hand to really fill up the engine with stuff. An empty engine is always faster than an engine that is already having uh, lots of in-flight instances inside it and some state in the database and on disk and stuff like that. Um, so that ramp up time is definitely good. And usually people do something like three or five minutes, maybe sometimes one minute is enough. That also depends on the workflow instance duration. 
Um, and then we have the duration of the real test run. Um, most most common is that people have a certain run duration, um, how long they run a certain experiment. And then that's what we record here as well for comparison. So, and yeah, there are different ways how to end an experiment. So run duration is one variation where you say, okay, I'm running for an hour and then measure my results over this hour. Another alternative would be to say, um, we run a certain number of process instances and once they are done, then we, we stop. So those are kind of the, that's the end criteria of the loop, so to say. And uh, yeah, some benchmarks would have a start throughput that is fixed. For example, with JMeter, you can configure it in a way that it starts workflow instances at a certain pace. Okay. Um, or also, this is something that we are doing in our own benchmarks. We have a fixed rate, and um, we you know, make sure that we always start a new workflow instance every couple of milliseconds or so. Um, Max yeah. payload size? Payload size, yeah, that is simply the variable payload. Um, it has a, a certain impact if you have larger variables. So um, that is something that is worth me measuring. And it's a bit simplified here um, because obviously variables might be created over on the fly uh, over the course of the workflow. But um, for simplicity, I just kept this here as a starter. And you will see in our ZB benchmark, we actually have the, the entire payload as a start variable. So it's one way of simulating payload. And uh, yeah, then one last thing, also not necessarily the starter parameter only, but um, if you work with BPMN message events, then you would have a message time to live. Um, typically that's specified in minutes. And yeah, if you work with messages, this could be an important setting to look at. All right, so that's the starter or load generator. Usually they play nicely together. Um, so typically what you actually have is you have a start application, maybe a, an application using the Java client and you deploy that somewhere. And then um, the load generator would invoke that start application, for example, using a REST call. And then um, whenever it gets, uh, whenever this start application gets a new REST call, it would then translate that into starting a workflow in ZB. Okay, so that's the load part. Then we have a bigger block here, which is the engine configuration. And yeah, depending how far you go, it goes all the way until here. <laughs> so, and yeah, obviously here, the first we'll want to know what engine version is um, are, you, are you working with? Because the different versions might have differences in their performance behavior. Um, mm -hmm. Josh, you made a nice little uh, benchmark where you compared different engine versions and see uh, to see what are the improvements that we made over time. Yeah, exactly. If you you know if you run this profile, your workload and you know your typical performance, and then there's a new ZB release, you just run the same thing again, exactly the same thing. Get a new set of numbers, and you can look at it and say, hey, if we upgrade to the new release, are we going to what impact will we see on performance? Are our workloads going to run faster, or is this going to slow down, or what's going to happen? You know. Yeah, so it's pretty mm -hmm. useful like that. Exactly. And you are hinting here on a very important strategy for benchmarking, um, especially if you're looking for a bottleneck and you're trying to improve the situation, then it's always advisable to change one single parameter at a time because then the results that you get will show you exactly what that one parameter has as an influence. And in your case, it was the ZB version that you changed, so you can have different results for the different ZB versions. Mm. Um, okay. Machine type, this is an interesting one. Yeah, the machine type is very interesting because obviously hardware makes a big difference. And for the machine types, we even have a separate spreadsheet here where I captured, oh, you see, I need to give a permission here. So, um, 
Yeah, in this machine type spreadsheet, there's a collection of um, standard machine types. Um, some of them are, for example, from Google Cloud, another couple are from uh, AWS. Amazon. And of course, you can add your own machine types here and then and re reference them. Um, but if you happen to run something on uh, some of these standard environments, then you can also use that. Um, so for example, our benchmarks that we use internally, they run on a Google Cloud instance that's called N1 Standard 16, basically a 16 vCPU machine. Mm. Um, yeah, I know you capture all sorts of details here. Um, yeah, caching makes a difference sometimes and I capture the price so that we can actually also do some pricing calculations. Um, so yeah, this is this this part. And then typically just take the machine name from here and then put that in the spreadsheet at this point. Right on. Okay, now to the standard config parameters of ZB. Um, usually ZB is a cluster, meaning we have multiple nodes. Um, each node would then have a certain number of vCPUs assigned to it. Um, and what we mean here is not what the physical hardware is doing, but but what's available to ZB. So for example, if you run ZB in Docker or on Kubernetes, you would typically have a limit of how much CPU the engine can use. And um, that's the number that we want to capture here. Same with the memory. We want to um, capture the memory limit of what the ZB process can use before it gets, um, before it exhausts its resources. And th those are ones are per node, right? So you have, for example, here hyper threads per node. And that's an important one as well. We always talk about hyper threads, not cores, um, simply because that's what also all the hyperscalers are talking about, right? So if you talk to Google, they will tell you something like vCPUs, and this means hyper threads on a CPU core. Typically, if you have like a eight core machine, you would actually have 16 hyper threads because most vendors currently at least have two hyper threads per core. Okay, um, then uh, obviously exporters can play a big role. I put a collection of different exporters in here and I tend to use a certain prefix to make it a little shorter. So for mm -hmm. example, a classic exporter that most, most people have uh, is the elastic exporter. Um, and then that would be noted here because exporters do have a big impact. For example, the debug exporter is uh, notorious for really uh, impacting the performance a lot. So the when you benchmark the, the debug log exporter, yeah. Right. Um, so you should not have that enabled if you are testing for performance. Um, so then uh, what else? We have the threading configuration for ZB. We have uh, usually the IO and CPU threads. I won't oh, go great. into well, much detail um, how- you've got the environmental var variable there. That's yeah, handy. Indeed. I try to document this a little. And yeah, by the way, if, uh, once this is public, feel free to also make suggestions of how to improve this or what documentation to add. We will share it in a way that um, yeah, people can make suggestions um, so that we can evolve this together. Um, yeah, then, as I said, I, I won't explain all the configuration too much in detail. This, this is, we don't have enough time here. I would just at this point assume that you're somewhat familiar with ZB's configuration. Um, so then we have partitions, replication factor. These are kind of classic major parameters, but then there are more subtle ones, like for example, the message size and the log segment size, the snapshot duration. Um, in ZB25, we added a parameter for memory map files and uh, to- Apparently that out. makes it go really fast. Yep, That's we have someone seen said some... in the uh, in the forum. Mm -hmm. That is true. This parameter has a big impact, and or let's say it like that: the parameter was there since a while, but in ZB25 we made it um, stable again, so it also works in all situations. Cool. So that is now usable. Um, more ex experimental is this raft flush. Um, this is. Uh, something that is similar to what Kafka is doing. So we don't flush to disk on every uh, raft exchange. We just do this when it's really necessary. Um, then here we recorded this type. 
very important because, for example, ZB usually requires SSD to be fast. If somebody runs on magnetic disks, that will probably be slower. And the disk size could also have an impact, especially uh, if you're using the cloud providers. For example, in, in Google Cloud, um, they would give you a I.O. performance that is linear to the amount of gigabytes you are requesting. All right, um, then we have the back pressure configuration. To be honest, this is kind of incomplete. I just have a couple of parameters here. And since we have multiple algorithms with multiple parameters each, this probably will grow over time here to, to add more. Um, so feel free also to make a suggestion here if you need something. Um, then JVM, this is also really just one little JVM parameter out of maybe 30 or so that people could play with to really squeeze everything out. Um, but the RAM percentage is one of the more prominent ones to control. And default would be 25% here. Um, and then RocksDB also has some interesting parameters. Uh, this is something we also exposed in ZB25 that you can play with RocksDB configurations. And these two here are, uh, let's say, one of the more dominant ones for memory limitations. Okay. Um, let's go with Elastic. Here I went a little bit more simple, um, just Elastic version, number of vCPUs, memory, and storage capacity. Um, this shouldn't really have a big impact on ZB's direct performance, but depending on which part of the system you're optimizing, maybe the Elastic part also is important. I think I should add the number of Elastic nodes in here, right? Yeah. Because most likely people don't have just a single node, but actually a whole cluster. OK. Then um, the gateway, the ZB gateway does have own parameters. Uh, I just captured here the timeout. So as you can see, I'm kind of focusing a little bit on parameters that I have seen with customers to have a bigger impact. Um, and there are obviously many more parameters. So feel free to augment this if needed. OK, and then we come to the worker. And uh, the worker, well, it might be the same application that you also use for the starting. Many people, for example, have a Java application and then just have both the starter and the worker logic inside there. Um, nevertheless, for the benchmarking, it could also be that you separate these out. And then again, we, we know which client is being used for the job worker, the number, the number of worker clients, then uh, CPU and memory for those, then uh, yeah, those are classic worker configs here, polling interval and request timeout. The, then we have the threading configuration and the maximum jobs that can be active in a single worker. So basically all of these ones here are specific to one worker instance. And last yes. but not least, we have the non-blocking uh, job work and the non-blocking job complete. This is kind of similar to the start that I explained. Um, you could synchronously, whenever you receive a job, work on it synchronously and synchronously complete it. That way you will not work on another job until you completed the first job. And doing this all in a non-blocking fashion is probably more, uh, yeah, saving you some resources and also does ensures that you don't have any blocking in, in the client side that could then slow down performance. And in some cases, we simply had not enough bandwidth on the worker side and that then slows ZB down, of course. Uh, the jobs can't get processed fast enough. Okay, we're gonna to have to blaze through this next part. We got 15 minutes left. <laughs> yeah, the next part is easy um, because this is really just different configure, uh, like different measurements that you can take now. So for example, we have the classic throughput, like finished workflow instances per second. Um, you have the process instance duration, um, and then different variations of that, right? For example, for the duration, you could also have the standard deviation of that. That usually tells you a little bit about the distribution. Mm. 
Um, you can capture things like your test duration, especially if that wasn't fixed in the load generator. Um, then here we have some formulas. Those are pre-filled. You can just reuse those. Um, they would uh, do some, you know, summing up all the hardware you're using and then also sum up the, um, the price. That obviously depends on uh, having the right pricing configured in the machine template. Okay, and then we have some data on CPU utilization. You know, sometimes you don't have to fill all of that. Uh, it depends on what you're looking at. Um, then also on the process instance duration, sometimes we are looking in detail on the percentiles, like 90th or 99th percentile, or the pure maximum of the process instance duration. Um, another interesting measurement that you could take is the no maximum number of in-flight instances, like how many workflows are running at the same time. And one then, yeah, it comes more to the documentation part. I really recommend you to put a timestamp on stuff because uh, once you start doing multiple benchmarks, then uh, a timestamp would allow you to identify a test and maybe also find the data in the Grafana dashboard and things like that. Yeah, and then uh, finally are some more specialized columns for RocksDB, um, which would do some theoretical calculations on the memory limits. Maybe we don't have to go too detailed in there. Um, once you fill in some data on the left-hand side, um, you will see that. All right, now my goal was to get us at least one sample entry in here based on the on the benchmark that we are using for testing ZB on a regular basis. Okay, reckon you can pull it off in 12 minutes? <laughs> will be challenging, but I will try my best. Awesome. So let's have a look. Um, this project is also available on GitHub and we can actually share the, the link in the show notes. Um, let me quickly open it here. So it's actually part of the normal ZB repository that we have a benchmark project and different uh, configurations are usually being there as well. And you know what? Let me actually make sure that I'm up to date with this. So um, there is a benchmark project. And it's asking you for your um, passphrase for your key. Thank you. Okay, so this is this. Um, we will probably want to open this a little bit. Um, let me just check which process we are using here. So this is all using uh, Kubernetes by the look of it. Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. Just a second. This one I need as well. Yeah, that's what I thought. I think the default is the one task process. So in okay. the very simplest de benchmark that we are doing, we're taking a process that looks, um, no, come on, like this. Simply a single service task and nothing more. And what you could do is, um, first of all, capture this process, right? So for example, we can take a quick screenshot here, put it in the spreadsheet directly. Um, mm. And that processes tabs mm -hmm. uh, right there. Cool. And there's this feature that you can actually um, pull an image into a cell and then it will even Fill respect the resizing of that cell. Awesome. So this is, what was it called again? One task. 
And now, um, I mean, this is super simple, but it makes a big difference what size of model you're testing with. And in this case, we have one service task, we have two events in there. So that means we have two other flow nodes and you can see all the other things here are already summing up. Um, what does this mean? Well, um, total, yeah, in this case, also the same, oops. Um, we are counting on the one hand, the critical path. And that means like, well, how long is the longest path in your process model? And uh, so that's the red part and the volume of the happy path or the path under test, that would be, um, for example, if the path you're testing in your test case also has parallelism, then it would increase the volume, but not the critical path length. length. So you can do multiple tasks in parallel, which gives you a higher overall task throughput, but um, the, the length, the duration might not get longer because of the parallelism. So um, I guess we explained that a little better in the other video that we did about this, um, where we dig yeah. your benchmark. Um, so you're also benchmarking your process design. You, well, you can. You can use it to test different kind of designs for your processes as well as benchmarking the engine configuration and the indeed, workers yeah. and stuff. So sometimes uh, if you have a requirement that is you need to keep your workflow duration very short, then it can make sense to use parallelization. And then those the, the green and the red part will actually become different. Mm. And that can have an impact. I think I had a customer example where this made a couple of seconds in a in a workflow that didn't take too long, like I think was 10 seconds or something like that. And then we chopped off two, three seconds just by redesigning the process model. Right. And the other important aspect is that once we know how many flow nodes a workflow has, um, then we can also use that to, to compare different test results that use different processes because we can then normalize on the number of flow nodes in a diagram. So you would see, for example, here in the, in the performance, we have a throughput in process instances per second and flow node instances per second. And the same mm -hmm. also with the duration. So, and the flow node instance based metrics, they are independent of the process diagram because they're kind of normalized to flow nodes. And obviously there are some differences between different BPMN elements, but it gives you some rough estimate of the throughput you're doing independent of your workflow. All right, so that is uh, that part. So here I would simply take the name of, our, of the workflow and enter it in the first column. Now the load generator, in our case uh, for the ZB benchmark environment, we have a um, a Java application. So I guess basically the Java app is the is the load generator. We also use the Java client in there. Um, typically we have one thread. Um, we don't have any ramp up time and no limit in the run duration. There's also not really a limit in the process instances to start. So in this case, um, probably what makes more sense is just dashing them out because we don't really have values there. Um, what we do is a fixed throughput of workflow instances per second. And this would be visible here. Um, so this is 300, that means 300 milliseconds. And that basically says, uh, yeah, start a new workflow every 300 milliseconds. Or no, wait a second, this is, 300 per second, was it, right? Now I'm struggling. Rate, you would have, uh, yeah, I don't know, it could be either, but I would imagine rate 300 per second. Yeah, it would have been good if they said rate dot per second or something. <laughs> <laughs> or rate dot milliseconds. <laughs> I've started naming my constants like that. Let me just... I always forget. Uh, I guess we could uh, document it somewhere after, right? For people. 
No, wait, I think this is what I need to do. No, I think it's 300 per second. Sorry. That sounds uh, more realistic. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Um, now, by default, does it wait or do you have to configure uh, that? No, it's working asynchronously. It actually uses two threads, one that is starting workflows and the other one that is catching the responses. Um, mm. But the start is not blocked by the wait for the response. OK. So in that case, it's a dash. And that ensures that we really have this fixed rate of 300 per second from the client side. Right on. Um, so, so then payload size, this uh, in this benchmark can also be seen um, because there is a big payload, JSON, that is apparently configured here. And then we can just go in the project and look for that file, big payload JSON. So this is having a size of um, 45.8 kilobytes. And that's okay, exactly. But just over three minutes to bring it home. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything special here. It's probably doing, well, it doesn't use messaging really. So okay. all that. Yeah. So then ZB engine that would usually be latest um, machine type. I mentioned that earlier. That was the end standard sixteen, uh, and one standard sixteen. And now this is interesting, right? We have sixteen CPUs in here, and sixty gigabytes of memory. But not all of that is going to be available to ZB. Um, Cluster size, yeah. Now let's look at some other. This will be in the screen. YAML stuff, right? For Kubernetes. Exactly. Now we go into the default config, uh, default values, probably. Yep. So here we see cluster size is three. So this is simple copy and paste. Let me do split screen here to be a bit faster. Um, So this is usually easy. That's what most people know. Well, here we go, um, vCPUs. And now it's not the 16 cores that the machine is having or the 16 um, vCPUs, but actually we see the limit here is two per node. Mm. And okay. memory limit is also two gigabytes. Mm. Exporters, um, let's see what we have here. Um, gateway, gateway. Oh, wait a second. I think this was the gateway resources. That sounded sounded a little small to me anyway. So here we want the broker resources. Um, this looks like I can see a ZB broker exporters elastic search args index ignore variable values above. Uh, broker execution metrics exporter enabled. So it looks um, like it's got elastic and metrics. Yeah, exactly. That's what I what I would also say. Metrics. Um, so then the threading config is probably here, four and four. IO threads, CPU threads, partitions, three, replication factor three, max message size is probably all on default because this is a default configuration. Um, so I can basically copy all that from here make my life easy. So mm. uh, maybe it didn't mention that. There is a first column, the first row, this is the default values of ZB. And then I have minimum and maximum. So you can like across all your tests, see what were the boundaries of your configuration space. Um, we can move on here. All this is probably all default as well. See how fast I'm getting now. I'm catching up with the time. <laughs> we have 30 seconds. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we can stretch a couple of minutes. Um, so elastic, well, I don't know the, the, the details here. Oh, did we see something? Oh yeah, here we go. Three and eight. And uh, it actually has three replicas. Okay, come on, let's put, let's put a column here. Um, take another five minutes on. Okay, five minutes starting now. <laughs> So, oops. So, 
here we have three nodes. Um, storage capacity, wow, well, 600 gigs, that's good. Epic. And we see also here SSD storage, um, that's pretty much needed for any of these systems to work fine. So now let's come to the worker. This is another interesting one. Um, I happen to know that we're using a Java worker. Um, do we see, no, that's not in this file. That would be here, there's a worker. And in the benchmark suite here, worker and starter are separate. Hmm. So, um, okay, it's got four CPUs and two gigs of RAM. Well, let's first look at the number of workers overall. And we see here 12 replicas. Uh, you already discovered four CPUs, 12 gigs of RAM. I know, two, two gigs of RAM ah, per two. each one. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So then polling interval, I'm not sure if this is, oh yeah, here we go. Polling interval, one millisecond. Um, request timeout. 62,000 by the look of it. That's probably milliseconds and I have seconds here. So, well, then 62, 62. seconds. Easy math, no need for formulas here. But that's yeah. one of the beauties of such a spreadsheet. You can actually use formulas. For example, if you want to compute your um, number of partitions based on replication factor and cluster size and number of CPU cores, then you can easily develop a formula for that and calculate it. Um, okay, now comes to the interesting bits, the job work. And I mean, in this worker, it doesn't make too much of a difference. Let me open it up anyway. Do it on GitHub. Oh, I do it here quickly. Okay, so the worker code is actually in here, so people can go in and look at that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, and again, this is all part of the public ZB main repository. Okay, and the worker is using. So you see here is the job handler, um, and it's. Basically, it's immediately completing the job. And add some variables. No. Okay, we got two minutes left in the overtime. Maybe, um, do you want to, does Grafana, is there any point in looking at Grafana? Yeah. How does that fit into all of this? That's kind of the output stuff, right? The Grafana stuff. Is that where you get the the results from? Yes. So I think at least just to quickly finish this part, we could already see worker capacity is 120. That's this job here and number of threads. Uh, well, I don't know, I need to see. Um, it did seem like it works more asynchronously, so should be fine. Yeah, now if you have a standard ZB setup on Kubernetes, you should also have Grafana installed with it. And we provide you with a really cool dashboard that shows you lots of metrics. And then um, this metric is running exactly the config that we are that we were looking at. And for example, you can immediately see the number of uh, process instances completed per second on average. So that's the throughput, 117. Uh, that goes here, 117. Um, now FNIs per second, this would be where we take your process model into account. And I think I had a reference is broken here. So basically this would be take the throughput that you have and then div multiply by the number of flow nodes, which is three in this case, right? And that also matches what we see in Grafana, I think. No, 100, 346. We even have a direct measurement that's even better. Then let's do, use that one. Mm. So you can compute it or you can measure it. Either way works. Process instance duration. I think we should see that in Grafana as well. And uh, that is, I think, here. Nope. Wow, there's a lot of uh, data in here. Yes, there is. 
it probably could deserve a full session just to look at this. I think it does, yeah, to go over the Grafana stuff. How about we schedule another session then to, to go in depth on Grafana because we're not even touching the surface with this. Yeah, sounds like a good idea. Yeah, okay, um, let's do that. I thought we have some metric on this. And then we can also link in because we didn't we've done we've done a real deep dive on this spreadsheet where we like really went into it. And so I mean if people get to this point and they're like, I'm in, I want to use this thing now that it's available. You know, this 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 video is really about people getting an idea of what it is and okay, here's this thing, it's now available. If you like it and you want to use it and you want to know more in detail about it, you can watch the the longer stream about it. And then also we're going to do one about Grafana and the outputs. And then the other thing that, you know, we skipped over this time is how do I actually start that benchmark, right? <laughs> like I saw that it's in the ZB repo. I got a good sense of how it's configured and, you know, I can scrub back and watch the video and, and, and inspect the source code. But how do I actually get it to run and output that Grafana stuff? I'd like to see that too and, uh, and go into the depth on the Grafana results. Yeah. So how about we do that um, this week or next week? Yeah, we can talk offline when to syn uh, synchronize and, and schedule that exactly. Yeah, okay. And so when are we going to make this available? Are we going to do it today? Yeah, so this is basically live right ready, now. Ready for pushing, exactly. I probably Our should operators push. are standing by. Please call 0900, yeah, 555 <laughs> Falco Menga. So uh, we want this to be anyone oh, with the link. Here it is going yeah. live. It's going comment. live. Comment. Epic. And yeah. so if you want to take that link, well, I will Slack it to you and you can uh, Slack it to me and I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Exactly. Okay. Awesome. And then we'll, uh, we'll schedule the part two where we go into launching that um, benchmark and then going deep into the Grafana side of things. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a plan. Awesome. Great work on this uh, performance profiling stuff, Falco. It's super in-depth. This is German engineering at its finest. <laughs> yeah. We had, we had um, Hugh Ward pop in, and here's what he's got to say. Can you see that comment there? <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks for the feedback. Came for the performance tuning tips. Came came for the Falco and stayed for the performance tuning tips, ZB. Awesome. So we'll let you know when we'll be broadcasting part two of this, and uh, I'll have this up on YouTube, and we'll put out the the link for the spreadsheet. You can download it. Here we go. Hugh Ward says he's never seen benchmarking like this. It's a it's a new level. Awesome. Thanks for taking time out of your morning this morning, uh, Falco. Thanks to Hugh Board. And I can see Need for Eats also tuned in for tuning in live. And uh, yeah, to everyone out there watching this and the millions of people out there watching it on the internet in the future. All right. Thanks.